Fucking me, it might be recording. Ooh. I shouldn't have started oh. recording like that, okay, but there you go. No. It's all raw and unedited, unedited in the strangers yeah, in space world. Fix that in post. Okay. Okay, this puts more pressure on the introduction now, um, because this is actually going out as a video. So if I get the introduction wrong, everybody watching the video will know what an asshole I am. <laughs> so let's let's um, this is all a bit inside. What order do you want to introduce yourselves? It's going to be you, then it's going to be Ian, then it's going to be me. Obviously, it'll be me first. Okay, great. I shall start. You're listening to Strangers in Space, and for the next 30 minutes, we're going to be reviewing Power of the Doctor, so you don't have to. Hi, I'm Matt. I'm Ian. And I'm John. And so we've gathered, We've. I've, it's literally just finished. So this is 15 minutes after Power of the Doctor, and we're basically the, the SAS Strangers in Space team. Who, who don't have to get an early night tonight, or who are <laughs> operating in a different time zone, who can give our instant reaction, and then the uh, the core actual uh, strangers in space team are going to be recording tomorrow night a second reaction, and I might be there as well to give two reactions, and I might I might just piss about and give completely different views <laughs> for each for each review. I was going to say, not. are you going to change your mind overnight? <laughs> Well, we'll see. I might work out what happened overnight. Um, so we're reviewing. So this is Power of the Doctor, Jodie Whittaker's final episode, um, an hour and a half of Daleks, Cybermen. There are going to be spoilers in this review, um, obviously, because we can't review it without it. Daleks, Cybermen, the Master, um, all the most of the living doctors of the uh, old series have returned, mm. apart from Tom Baker. Yeah, apart from Tom. No one yeah, and, the, the, and, the big finished doctors. And one dead <laughs> fake, fake doctor has returned um, in the form of David Bradley. Um, a number of companions have returned briefly at the end. Um, and two companions return substantially. Um, Dan leaves. Graham comes back for a little bit. Um, Yaz and Graham leave again. Um, Kate Stewart's in there somehow. Um, um, Joe Martin. It, Joe Martin's there as Joe well. Joe Martin's come back, so that's another living doctor that who comes back. Um, so this is kind of oh, and David Tennant. <laughs> Don't forget him. And and David Tennant is in this as well. So, what do we think? So, <laughs> so John, what, what's your immediate reaction? It's a lot, isn't it? <laughs> they did stick. Everything in there, plus the kitchen sink. Uh, I, I can't believe how willing they were to make that many kisses to the past. Um, you know, all the Doctor's companions, an Adric reference on TV in 2022 to celebrate the was it, 40th anniversary of his death. And, you know, uh, I, I'm saying, to, William to, sorry, bloody... To... Yeah. William, to, commemorate, to commemorate the 40th commemorate. anniversary. Not, we don't celebrate yeah. Adric's death on this podcast. We're very pro Adric. <laughs> and William Bloody Russell. That's all I can yeah. say. But William yeah. Russell. I've been wanting that for God damn it. Uh, I, I, I could see Ian um, slowly I, going purple, slightly purple. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've given Chibble almost everything for that. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I mean, they missed a the trick by not getting. Uh, William Russell to skydive off the building. <laughs> <laughs> off the building. That's, that's kind of that's kind of the William Russell action I was looking for. Skydive for tremendous work. accuracy. <laughs> so, so Ian, what's your immediate reaction? You obviously you love Legend of the Sea Devils. Oh, you're a massive fan. So, <laughs> as a massive a massive fan, how do you react to this? It, I'm I'm trying to work out who it was for. Okay. Because I think what's typified and characterised the Chibnall era is that it's great if you're an eight-year-old kid, um, mm. but there's not a lot going on if you're not. Yeah. With this, however, it was clearly aimed solely at us. Yeah. Um, and so we were supposed to love it. And okay. parts of it were quite good. Mm -hmm. I think it's Chibnall trying to do something like Day of the Doctor, isn't it? Absolutely. There was a you know very much this is this is my day of the doctor um 
And also it echoed the end of series four of uh, you know, New Who, where you've got all the companions around the console. Yeah. And, um, so it was it was trying to sort of strike a lot of notes, but basically it was trying to do like the greatest hits two to Dave the Doctor's greatest hits one. And um, I don't want to be the one that goes first. <laughs> okay, well, well, shall I? I really, I actually really like this, and I, I found myself enjoying it. So let's let's do the bad things first. Okay. Um, co- controversially, the, okay. The Chibnall dialogue still is awful. So there's yeah, still that's a lot changing. of looking at looking at a piece of technology, describing exactly what the piece of technology is doing. I think that was that was there were distractions from that this time, not with wit, because there's no real there's not many jokes in this. The distractions are nostalgia, as you say. I think this is this is something that's going to appeal to to mid 40s Doctor Who fans. Um, He's he pinches a lot of lines from from past writers as well, which actually I think work really well. He pinches a lot of it. It is RTD fan fiction. So there's two booths. That's from an RTD. There's, as you say, the companions around the TARDIS. Yeah. Um, there's a tower block with Cybermen invading in London. So this is this is him raking through RTD. And I don't mind that. Um, so there's there's actually a lot of things I I really enjoyed. And I got a real sort of emotional punch, which I wasn't expecting. Um and actually, I think it does work for eight-year-olds. I think it's probably, I think it's possibly unfair. I think it is aimed at us, which is why it's it's hit me slightly emotionally. But I think if you're an eight-year-old, if you see Sophie Aldred beating up a Dalek with a baseball bat, you're still going to enjoy watching Sophie Aldred beating up a Dalek. You don't need to know Remembrance of the Daleks to enjoy that. And you still will enjoy um, Tegan being, being grumpy. <laughs> so I think... He, even though there are massive nods to the past, I think there's lots of, I mean, this is action, wall-to-wall action, and surprisingly fairly coherent, not particularly balanced, but fairly coherent. Um, so that's that's my view. Mm. I want to drill into your, your unexpected emotional response that you were well, talking about. Did you do a little cry when um, Sylvester and Sophie had their little conversation? No, I didn't do a little cry, but I did get... It was actually to, um, uh, Janet Fielding and Peter Davison oh, okay. that moment. And it wasn't, I don't think, just because I remember them from growing up. I think Peter Davison was really, really good. Yeah. playing that yeah. scene it was it was like time crash but he was taking it really seriously and I, I think Peter Davis and I think I think Janet Fielder I think Sophie Aldred gives her best performance she's ever given in in Doctor Who I think she's far better now than she was and I really liked Ace back in the day and I liked that period of Doctor Who but I think I, I was always worried I didn't think that she could do an Elizabeth Sladen and come back because I didn't think she had that kind of acting pedigree, acting ability. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. There was always a, a feeling that if she if she went, if you imagine the dial of yeah. Aldredness, if she gets past say seven, she she gets dangerously close to that boom moment from Battlefield, yes. which is always so. But I think by keeping herself very much in the center of the dial, there she managed mm-hmm. to give a really consistent. Uh, an entertaining performance, and I liked her a lot more than I liked Janet Fielding. Yeah, I, Ooh, I thought John. I thought it, what was really worked so Fielding basically she gets to play Ace as, as just an action hero. You know, there's no, there's only that one particularly scene which she has to you know do the emotional bit. It's it's almost like it's an old Who style thing for her. For her. She's going back, playing almost a stereotype of a companion, but with the added nostalgia bit. And who doesn't want to see Ace go around smacking dogs with baseball bats, firing at side men with lasers, jumping off buildings? And yeah, I, I, I thought they, I didn't think they quite knew what to do with Tegan because, you know, she just gets to change her mind a bit, run around the building. It's good to see her back, but, you know, it, it's also like she was there as an ornament at times. So, so I've got two things. I think I think the change in the way Doctor Who's made has suited Sophie Aldred better. So the multi, the, the ability to have multiple takes, and not have all the pressure on 
filming it, not having to film it like a stage play, basically, sort of yeah. suits Sophie Alden. It wasn't quite like that in the 80s, but it was pretty, you know, if you got it in the can, then that was it. You didn't get a chance to say, actually, actually, Andrew Morgan, could I have another take? Because I don't feel like I really embodied, <laughs> em- embodied <laughs> Merlin's thing at that point. So I think I think the ability to have multiple takes works. I I I agree. I don't think Janet Fielding had a lot to do, but I was impressed with the amount that she did do. I think Tegan was a great character to bring back because Tegan is is dis, is distinctive as being. I mean, at the time in the nineteen eighties, there was a problem with Tegan because she didn't want to be in the TARDIS and she was grumpy all the time. Now that's a really good source of comedy. That's a really good source of humour, and I really loved those bits where. She's kind of like, no, I will go into the TARDIS if you don't mind and storming in. And that kind of, that's a sort of a big finish kind of Tegan coming through. There, there was, yeah. I, th- I think the thing, you pick those Ace and Tegan because they're the two companions from the 20th century series who you can say, and they're available as feminist role models there. I think yeah. that's what they're aiming for. So it kind of fits into celebrating the era of that first woman doctor as much as it does just at returning them. Yeah. So you didn't think you didn't you weren't convinced by Janet Fielding. I you, you monster. So I no, it no, wasn't no. so much Janet Fielding. It was I don't feel Tegan was written exactly as I would have expected. I mean, she could have been crosser, she could have given the doctor a bit of a slapping. Um she could have been bearing in mind she's had 40 years since we last saw her to get tougher. Um, the character felt a lot softer and a lot more easily flustered than she did in, say, yeah. Resurrection of the Daleks, so or yeah. or whatever it was called, the one she was in. Um, oh, that is Resurrection, yeah. yeah. Thank God for that. I'd have appeared an idiot otherwise. <laughs> um, so I just uh, it was it was a writing thing, and the and the as always, the writing is best typified by that line about. Um, Oh, I haven't seen the Doctor in forty years. Oh, show off just because it's been thirty years for me. See, I is... didn't. Did that actually appear in the in the story? I must have missed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Okay. That was there, yeah. and it was and it was so bad. It was oh, I couldn't but, breathe for about thirty seconds. Yeah, but... but I thought the throwback I liked on the Chippewa's line was your. How did you escape from Gallifrey? Magnificent attention to detail. Move on. <laughs> that's, 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 I loved it. There were there were moments. So the the. The the unmoffetness of the writing for me was typified when um, when I think the doctor and Kate Stewart walk into the building and the doctor says, oh, you've got a you've got a tower block. This is impressive. And if Moffat had been writing it, Kate Stewart would have said something incredibly funny about science and sort of off an off kilter comment. And she just says, yeah, or thanks. And I think that there are gaps in Chibnall's script where the jokes should be or where the unusual dialogue should be and that always stands out and but in this particular story i i was i was upset about that kind of rarely because every time there was one of those gaps a dalek got blown up or <laughs> or he stole a line or an idea from from the past of the series which which works well, and actually I don't blame him for doing that. It was kind of a that, that he gets the the sort of the double whammy of getting someone else's ideas into his script, which elevates it, but also <laughs> gets that kind of nostalgia. So we we kind of every time there's a sort of a little throwback to the past, it's great. And and again, I'll go back to Ace. The her saying she works so much better so much better in 2022. Than she did in 1980s, in the 1980s. Those words, the wicked and and what is tin can and all of her sort of mock swear words, just just kind of sound witty or sound kind of irreverent now. Yeah, I mean, and they're kind of punctured by other people as well, which is yeah, it, it, it's different context. It's more self-aware, isn't it, in, in the 21st century? Whereas yeah. back in the late, you know, in 1988. It's it, you know, as someone who was a teen at that point, clang. It doesn't sound like anyone you know speaking. So, so we'll we'll get. What about the doctors coming back, and and why are Colin Baker and Paul McGann so underserved? 
Well, because they haven't got companions who were. I know there. it's sad. Um, I was hoping. I was hoping they were going to just sneak in, like and, Grace Holloway somehow. <laughs> oh, and Perry. And Perry. Uh, uh, yeah, Perry was the one living companion missing. There wasn't she? I think. Well, is she canonically? So they they did go. So we we gave oh. a series. Of, okay, so we gave a series of predictions before this was on. You guys didn't, but Strangers in Space did. Um, I got m- most of my predictions wrong, and I can't really remember them. But one prediction was we went through the Earth, the companions we knew who were on Earth, and went through them and tried to work out if we we bettered that they would come back. So Ian Chesterton, we thought yeah. would come. Um, obviously, Katie Manning, we knew would come back because Katie Manning's accidentally shot her mouth off onto on Twitter. <laughs> wow. So, so in a sort of as did Sylvester McCoy, um, and we we thought um, Bonnie Langford would come back. I think that was a sort of a, a rumor that was floating around. Yeah. So Bonnie Langford, so Mel shouldn't necessarily be on Earth. She's obviously abandoned Glitz, or Glitz has brought brought her home. But Perry shouldn't be on Earth. Should you? Mm. Well, no, but if, but, you know, if, if Mel can make it back to Earth, then so can Perry. The epilogue of the My Walk novelization has her back on Earth, because I think she's managing Yukanos as a pro wrestler, if I, I remember. That is correct. So we could have seen Brian Blessed in a, in a sort of... Oh, you know, we was robbed! Mankini. <laughs> this, is, this is also a Mark Donaldson theory, Mark Donaldson of this parish, that the, um, the Blu-ray trailers... We're actually are actually I'm going to say the word canonical, and we're actually leading up to this this story. So Perry, we see kind of going off in the TARDIS, I think, because there's one yes, more adventure to be had, and Mel meets the Seventh Doctor. So uh, yeah, but we didn't get to see Perry. What about the the Doctors we did see? What what did you did you get anything from that? I was kind of half reminded, and the symbolism isn't quite there. But I was half reminded of Revelation, the, the new adventure. Yeah, yeah. Just with the Doctor at the crossroads, meeting, yeah. her, you know, meeting her past self and has to make a decision, which was kind of lovely. I don't think Chibnall's read the new adventures, but it had that echo for me anyway, which was lovely. Um, you know, they, they haven't got much to do, but it's just, again, it's, it's about that kind of celebration, isn't it? it it's... All these sort of multi-doctor big extravaganzas, they're supposed to be a bit of a party. Mm. So it's nice to have those guests at the party, even if you only see them for you know, 10 seconds before you have to rush off. Yeah. You- I mean, my question is, are we at the right party? Because this was supposed to be celebrating 100 years of the BBC. It's not a Doctor Who anniversary. That's next year. And if we've had the big Finnish doctors out of the way... What does that leave us for next year? So, so were Not you really hoping that negative, but, you're hoping yeah. the Doctor would would arrive at this sort of internal Netherlands and discover Lord Reef stands <laughs> sat there, sat there wanted, tree I wanted the education. I wanted to get, I wanted, entertain. <laughs> entertain them. Don't go into the gasm. <laughs> What I think I wanted was a straightforward story with lots of action and adventure. Where at the end of it, the Doctor regenerates. Not this whole um big deep dive into the psychology of the doctor and this ludicrous plan by the master um so can you explain them but can can somebody please explain because i'm not very good at watching these once and actually getting understanding what goes on yeah what, so, what actually happened so the master wanted to end his own life by stealing the doctor's body for no real reason or advantage yes. which okay. he did but yeah. it didn't work because uh he's an idiot and okay. the and doctor, through the medium of a herd of it, managed to uh, metamorphosize into some kind of hologram, which could look like various doctors, to encourage people to do the right thing so that she could get her body back because of a herd of it. And, yes. uh, and thus, therefore, uh, because of that, you had what you had. What, what about the volcanoes? I think the only thing you missed out was the, the master wanted to ruin the doctor's reputation. Yeah. That that was it. Okay. To the end, that okay. was the person. He looks like the master, though. Yeah, and he wanted to just blow up the planet for no good... Or the, Dal- the Daleks were just there to blow up the planet for no good reason. Yeah. I, I mean, so, to do with it. so in defence, in defence, 
it's a bit incoherent, but then most of Russell T. Davis's end of season specials are pretty incoherent. This is, but he gets, you get by on spectacle, on wit, on nostalgia. Um, yeah. And, and there was no reason at all for him to be Rasputin bar Chibnall wanting to rip off that scene from uh, Sound of Drums. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yes. But that was a good scene. It was a great scene. It was. A good I'm all for it. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I thought about it. when the normally I'm not into sort of um, cute moments, but when the Cyberman and the Dalek look at one another, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. That's, that's the kind of thing that I've been missing in in general. I genuinely think that 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 kind of that kind of yeah, I'd I'd like to think that that was in Chibnall's script, and he just went right. I need more humour. There's something wrong with my scripts. Let's add a joke or two. And that, that worked for me. Um, the Master? What do people think of The Master? I, what, is anybody a fan of this incarnation of The Master? I like him. He's probably my second favourite Master since the show came back. He's got that mania, which he's always had. Um you know, the, the Sasha Dewan master has always had that that kind of mania that a lot of other masters manage to hide or, or contain. Um, his his plans just seem to get more and more preposterous. Indeed. And <laughs> yeah, but there's also this sense where given given the number, it's, it's like all the, the villains in Doctor Who now, given the sheer number of times they fail to pull anything off, you think they'd just give up and go and work in a garden centre or something? Yeah, I mean that Please. that that would kind of mean the end of Doctor Who, wouldn't it? As a series, there's, there's plenty of other villains. I mean, I don't know where you guys stand on this, but there, you know, there was a moment where you've got Cybermen and the Master and the Daleks, and a little tiny part of me is just thinking, really, again? Oh, yeah, where okay. are the board, eh? Where are the mechanisms? I mean. You know, I just I just feel like these these three in particular have been done so far beyond the point of being done to death that yeah. they're almost they're almost back to life. Um, and the the Time Lord Cybermen that we got as well. I mean, I can't remember where we left them. I don't really. Oh, they were just the Gallifrey. Just, yeah. just, just yeah. the yeah. children, wasn't it? So what so what I did what I did like about the Time Lord the uh, the Cybermasters to give them their their accurate name is they formed part of the solution to the reverse regeneration which i thought was a neat bit of kind of storyline storyline linking so they weren't just there for spectacle they had they had a function in the storyline that's was, true and that is very clever and now that you've pointed that out and i've and i've noticed it i agree with you 100 percent okay so we'll clip that bit and play <laughs> that in <laughs> um so, that's, so on, that's on your tombstone now, you know. <laughs> what, did we think of, what did we think of Paul McGann? Oh, isn't he lovely? But doesn't doesn't he kind of stand? He needs something more than this, and I don't want to bang on about my Paul McGann needs a mini series. Hey, it's not Doctor. it's not just you, Matt. I mean, I, I I've long argued for this, and um, this the 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 thing it reminded me of actually when you had all those former doctors sitting there by that telegraph pole in the desert it wasn't so much uh the new adventures revelation it was it was yeah. zagreus it was yeah. like yeah. we're all playing other characters like these elder time lord figures um paul mcgann stood out because he doesn't look that much older than he did when he played the doctor um the rest of them you're thinking why are they all clearly about 40 years older than they should be um but yeah mcgann there's still so much left that they could do with him. Mm. And if the Doctor's going to, I don't know, hypothetically, no spoilers or anything, but if the Doctor's going to turn into a previous incarnation of the Doctor for some reason, wouldn't it have been great if it was Paul McGann? So I I really like that. That I love the Telegraph pole that had sort of a Narnia feel to it. Yeah. I, lo I think that way of doing it um, excuses them looking older. Because they are sort of mental, sort of internal, doctorish kind of projections, so they've aged in her, in her psyche. So Actually, that worked for yeah. me. I love the fact that they punctured that with the gag about the robes. 
that Paul McGann yes. doesn't wear doesn't wear ropes. No yeah. reason for that gag. Gag. There's yeah. nothing in the Paul McGann Doctor that particularly necessitates that. The only the only thing is Paul McGann is kind of a more a slightly more prestigious actor than the others. But and he's McCoy. And he's the only one who could still fit into his costume that would have been enough. <laughs> <laughs> well, dressing room. Well, they tried. They then the, the second projections they did fit. Um, McCoy into his costume, but it did look like somebody else's body with McCoy's head on it. Yeah, yeah. Did, am I alone? Because McC- no. McCoy, I don't want to be personal about McCoy, but McCoy is more rotund than that now. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, I think it was a, a, an eight out of ten um, visual effect to get away with it as well as they did. Um, they also <laughs> got away with it very well with uh, Peter Davison. I don't know why I stressed Peter, like there were two Davisons. Um, uh, and thank God, heavens, they didn't try anything with Colin Baker. Um, well, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's, yeah. <clears throat> so what about the, so the one thing about the introduction, and I think this is a, this is a Chibnall thing. So in, um, so he's, he's borrowing from RTD again. So it's uh, the Sarah Jane Smith moment in what, what does she come back in? School reunion. Yeah. So that moment where where not when she appears, but when she first meets the doctor, that's that's another moment when I kind of choked up back in the day because yeah. that was like that was a powerful moment. This this time the companions are just sort of oh, Ace and Tegan are just kind of there suddenly. I still got a bit of a sort of a, a you know a bit of a choked up moment with with Ace looking at a wall, but. But I do think that Ace looking at a, at a wall isn't a sort of a dramatic introduction of the companion. I don't know whether that's a problem. And again, I go back to, does it work with eight, eight year olds? I think it does because it kind of clearly, it makes it clear that this is somebody important from the past. I think an eight year old would watch this in the same way that an eight year old would watch the five doctors as I, as I did and somehow recognize Pertwee and Troughton instantly as the Doctor. And I don't think I watched repeats at that stage. I just instinctively knew from the way that they were talking and from the way they were dressed. And I think I think the same thing happens here. Everything was carefully coded so that an eight-year-old could could sort of follow it. John, what did you think about the whatever I've just talked about? <laughs> it, it kind of <laughs> you, falls you, out of my head as soon as you've I lost, it. You've lost your own thread there, haven't you? Yeah. <laughs> It's difficult because Eddie, who you know is fourteen, normally watch it. He's over in uh, at his cousin's at the minute, um, but I think he enjoyed it. <laughs> yeah. Actually, so yeah, it, it's you know it it will make us very happy because we are exactly you know everyone on this podcast pretty much is exactly the audience for the for this, for this episode. Yeah. But, uh, you know, yeah, you know, there's an. I think, you know, we underestimate what eight-year-olds can handle. They don't necessarily care about the kisses to the past. There was more than enough there to keep them entertained for the entire thing, you know. There's the bangs, there's flashes, there's Daleks, there's Sidemen, there's Sasha Dewan being very, very mastery. I, I think it would quite, you know, it quite have to keep every kind of audience happy. It, it, it's better aimed, I think, at a general audience than much of Chibnall's reign has been. Yeah, I th- I think I agree. And part of this this podcast, when we do reviews, we try to uh, imagine, you know, we we try to take ourselves out of the bodies of middle aged white, white <laughs> UK UK mostly based Doctor Who fans, and try to put ourselves into the mindset of the eight year olds and the girls, which sounds really creepy now I say it out loud. Um, but I, th- I, th- I genuinely think that it probably works. It would probably work for them because the doc, the, the Jodie Whittaker is the thing that underpins it for the, for your eight year old. She's I think really successful for the younger viewers, and I think that's one of her legacies is she's been really good at sort of drawing in younger viewers, and she's in this throughout and she has you know she's placed in jeopardy and she's in scary situations and she's reassuring. So she does all of that. She kind of compares the whole thing quite effectively. So I, I think they get away with it. My thing about the master, going back to that, because I realised that was the train of thought I hadn't finished. 
I think that kind of mania works again with a Moffat script or an RTD script. It's it's kind of you want them to be making jokes. That's why I like the Boney M moment because actually, actually that his mania has given a sort of a context, so it doesn't sort of stand out. Of course, that's as John said, stolen from RTD and stolen from this, the the uh, whatever it was, the journey, not journey then. Uh, sound the sound of drums. Sound of drums. Yeah. yeah. So I think I think it always stands out. So I think he's it's a brilliant performance. But and I'm going to say this cliche of a slightly weaker script. So that yeah. I think the dialogue doesn't serve the performance. But I think in this story, everybody's kind of everybody's kind of on their, on form. Actually, I think every performance in this works to serve the to serve the plot and to hide the deficiencies in the dialogue. For me, what do we think about the? Rather convenient and quick getting rid of John Bishop at the start. Yeah, go on then. Yeah. The, maybe, maybe he was busy, so it's we have to write him out quickly and can't give him a battle. It, it's the same thing you used to have with um, Bradley Walsh. You could see where he's got to go and film the chase. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just a convenience thing. But we got but to see Anfield did. again, so I'm happy. But he did get he did get a final action sequence. And he got a genuinely witty moment where he's he's driving the train and he gives the train driver's announcement. Mm. And beca- because and that was a really good sort of tone of voice he put he put on. And so that, that was my one of my rare John Bishop is funny in this moment, which is ironic for a comedian. But I think that was a moment when he was actually loud. I didn't kind of I didn't mind him sort of disappearing because. There's so much else. There. There's so much else. You're instant, yeah. you're instantly reintroduced to Ace and Tegan and and so I mean Graham probably gets about the same amount of screen time. Yeah. Um. But again, he's in it. He gives a really good witty. Him and Ace get have a really good chemistry. Oh, now, is that just spin off? Is that yeah. going to be canon now? Are they are they like going out now? Do we think? Oh. Yeah, well, is it, are there going to be the uh, the Ace and Graham adventures? With, with the big finished box set has already oh, been in the works. Sure. Just call it the Grace adventures, as, as <laughs> Doctor Who's nice. automatically creates uh, neologisms. <laughs> um, well, also, um, so that so some things that might upset upset certain parts of fandom. Um, the Doctor and Yaz's relationship, their love story, that kind of doesn't happen in this there was a lot of debate on twitter about whether they'll kiss and whether it will be a big thing but i think that was actually put to bed so to speak in legend of the sea devils really poorly and that was it so that that's the ending are we disappointed by that or is that i thought that the actual ending of it you know where they where they got to you know eat ice creams on top of the tar that's just looking down on the earth was kind of a perfect moment it's Something up as a, a platonic thing rather than a romantic thing. So it just, yeah. it's like just best buds. So, but yeah, dropping dropping her off at the end, just saying, oh, "I won't do this alone." So, and, and I like the way the doctor was able to hold all of her regeneration just in that one hand for yeah. presumably a couple of hours. While so, she's well, ice cream. So she had David Tennant's hand for a couple of hours. <laughs> <laughs> theory that's theory that's just occurred to me. So Capaldi managed to stop his regeneration by plunging his hands into the snow of Antarctica. She's stopping her regeneration by holding an ice cream, an ice cream <laughs> in her hands. I, okay, so I, uh, I was, I'm disconcerted that that their relationship basically did end in Legend of the Sea Devils. I think that's the fault of Legend of the Sea Devils rather than this. I thought their final scenes. I thought this was the best ending of a doctor for me in the modern era okay i think i think so tenants ending i think got bogged down with him indulgently closing closing up rtd's loose ends by visiting previous companions and i yeah. think that was an indulgence matt smith was quite good but i think it, it kind of took a bit of time i thought capaldi's speech was too long and a little bit schmaltzy I kind of found this one more emotional. And more yeah, yeah. So you it's... missed out Eccleston there. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> Don't forget about Chris. So, so Eccleston, Eccleston. In retrospect, watching it, 
all I can think of is he's really glad to be going. So he, <laughs> he's just really relieved to be regenerated. It's not like David Tennant, who you believe when he says, I don't want to go. Christopher Eccleston, you actually think he's going, oh, come on, let's get on with it. Let's get on with it. Let's change me, change me. <laughs> but yeah, I've, maybe maybe it's my, saying it's my favourite might be a, it's the first time I've seen one that I thought they're not over-egging this bit. Yeah. This bit's the right length. Uh, the actual regeneration is quite nice. She regenerates in Lulworth Cove in Dorset, so she goes back to the location of Curse of Fenric. That's, yeah, I was going to say, wasn't that? Wasn't that it's Curse of Fenric? That's the third, third door she uh, mm. she stands on, I think, mm. to regenerate. That's probably not canon, but it's it <laughs> obvious. How, as somebody that frequently went to Dorset, that does look like Dorset. Uh, yeah, what did I, you I, think of the last few I, scenes? I think it's kind of where Chibnall's instincts as a writer actually serve the story on that, because he's not one to dwell on things, you know, on the emotional potency like RTD does, or the idea or the cleverness, as Moffat does. So he kind of, he does have a problem with being quite sort of mechanical with the plotting, but it really kind of serves it quite nicely here. It doesn't overplay it, doesn't overreg it. He has a lot to get through, and it just kind of worked. I, I think you're right, it did work, and it's more, it's almost more an epilogue to the era, in a way, because, yeah. you know, you, you didn't have many of the running themes. You had the master, obviously, but, you, you know, you didn't have any of the time as children. You didn't have um, any kind of ongoing, you know, many ongoing. It's just, it's just a nice celebration rather than a, anything to do with plot, really. So the, uh, the, the second debate was what, what, who would she regenerate into? And this was a, this was a, a vote on the, uh, the podcast. Um, I'm, I'm, Happy to say I got it wrong. My theory was it would be a fade to black after the regeneration. I'm also happy to say that I was right in my reasoning that I didn't think they'd have the nerve to have David Tennant in Jodie Whittaker's costume. Yes. <laughs> because I think that would be an odd sight. I thought I was going to be proved wrong when Sasha Dewan is in Jodie yes. Whittaker's yeah. costume. <laughs> But actually, the, I was shouting, you cowards, at the screen <laughs> as her costume burnt off to reveal David Tennant's costume. Yeah, that was nonsense. That you can't, you can't suddenly, 15 regenerations in, you can't suddenly have, oh, but the clothes can regenerate sometimes. Well, they did on the first regeneration. Did they? Or yes. did they just decay slightly? Or, or did he just go and get a new coat out of the trunk? I, th I think so, okay. it was a okay. one, but... one mitigation to this is we don't quite know what's happened in that regeneration. And that that's sort of been explained that RTD is going to cover that. That's going to be a thing in his specials, that it's not a traditional regeneration. Something odd has happened in this regeneration, obviously. Yeah. Something odd has yeah. happened in this regeneration. Did, did you both stick around for the trailer afterwards? Yes. Yeah. yeah. So obviously you can see that Shooty Gatwa has done some filming already for that so so shooting shooting out was in the trailer but not looking like not looking doctory he nor really or sounding doctory no no but but i think i don't think he will be because rtd was saying he found kind of new things to do so i suspect he's going to be a very different kind of doctor on that front yeah i mean so i did that sorry hmm. I was going to say, I, I was with you, um, not that I heard what you predicted, but I thought we'd get a fade to black kind of ending. I thought the worst thing that could possibly happen is if she just regenerated into David Tennant. And I thought I'd seen enough from Tennant on Twitter or, or secondhand on Twitter to kind of imply that there are so many former doctors coming back next year that we shouldn't read too much into the fact that his stuff's been filmed and we know about it because... It was filmed on location, so we had to, hence they leaked it. Um, but, yeah, I, I, again, I don't want to sound negative, but when I saw him again and we got another what, what, what ending, I was like, oh, God. Well, I knew I mean, what, I didn't, you knew what the line was going to be, didn't you? You did, you did. It's well, everybody, everybody predicted that if it was Tenant, and we predicted, or JR probably predicted it, but then JR... JR probably saw the episode four months ago and he's sure. just pretending that he didn't. And he just sure. goes, oh, I've heard, I've heard rumours that this happens. Or my, <laughs> my instinct is that Colin <laughs> Baker will be back in robes underneath the telegraph hole. I don't know. <laughs> it's just how I would write it. He's it's just what I do, you know. Yeah. 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 Paul McCann um, a great line in there. 
Yeah. And there'll be a so, couple of holograms to solve this. So I think I, I, I think I was slightly disappointed by that David Tennant scene, but just because everybody predicted it was going to be. Do we think that was RTD writing it? Yes. Okay. I, don't, I think it's the old, it's a tradition now, isn't it? You hand over. What, yeah, you hand over, you get a, the, the next writer gets a scene. Or show it gets. Well, I, I, I think given how much Chibnall owes to RTD for sort of liberally stealing almost every element <laughs> of this episode from the RTD era, we could probably have trusted him to to sample the line "what, what, what," you know. Yes, um, oh, he did go. He did go old teeth. <laughs> or I recognise. Yeah. I recognise teeth. Oh, old teeth. What? Hmm. Um. So an, another another potentially controversial thing is the timeless children, the timeless child. John, this was a, a bugbear with you. You turned red last time we had that conversation. I... Um. The the strangers, in, the strangers in space um, policy, the standard standard strangers in space in space view was timeless children were done. The fob watch, the whole point was it stayed closed. It wouldn't be opened again. It just became the act of not opening the fob watch was the point. She didn't have to find out what happened in the past. Turns out that's the case. Do you think that the child they discover at the beginning in the casket? Do you think that was a, a red herring for the timeless children? Very, very deliberately, I think. And obviously it turns yeah. out to be this weird, not yeah. kind of weird energy alien, which is a really nice alien, actually. I like that. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. I think it was a de deliberate red herring. Ooh, is that an, is that, you know, the doctor's a child or anything? No. Um yeah, I suppose you could have fed the timeless children into it, because it is very much special about nostalgia and looking back. Mm -hmm. But, you know, thematically it would have fitted, but obviously Chibnall considered it absolutely done. So <laughs> that was the end of it. And Ian, do you agree that it's not absolutely, do you agree with John that it's not absolutely done? I, I it clearly is absolutely done and dusted and, and that's what Chibnall wanted to do with this whole idea. I mean, yeah. it feels like half a job. I think any other writer with that kind of, you know, starting that kind of story arc would have had the idea of maybe finishing that kind of story arc or doing something with it. But um, that 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 was clearly all that was ever going to be. Um, I mean, Chekhov's takes, gun, unfired. That yeah. kind of takes me on to the last question. I mean, well, there's loads to talk about, but I'll talk about them with some other people. <laughs> who actually I saw you then. Um, well, <laughs> the last one is, is this is the last this is the last Jodie Whittaker story. This is the last Chris Chibnall story. At last we can see the We've Chibnall survived era, the Chibnall, the Chibnall era. era in all of its all of its glory. We can be we can think of it as a as a whole. We can think of the Jodie Whittaker era as a whole. Mm. What do we think of it based on this now? Do we think that this is this is a masterful haha? -ha, um, tying up of the whole Jodie Whittaker era, summing everything up um, and ending it? Or what, what, what do we think? No, I, I, again, I, I think it's trying to be something broader than that. I don't think it was... You, you had kind of the icons of the era, so you had, you know, Sasha Dewan in it, but you had the Lone Sideman clone in there to celebrate. I, oh, I did like the, um, you know, Oh, you can actually undo tissue compression now. <laughs> I'm fine with that. That's, yeah, that's I'm, right. I'm good with it, yeah. Oh, and you know, how's your auntie Vanessa? Oh, that was, I haven't mentioned that. What a great line. Um, yeah, it was... Uh, obviously, we're going to be doing this as an episode and an yeah. episode yeah. later on, but... It, it was kind of, for me... It's not been my favourite year. I kind of think it's almost a better finale than the year deserved in a lot of ways. <laughs> and I, I, I don't say that now. So it's you know, it, no, it no. was one, it was one that hid the flaws of you know Chibnall's writing because for every if there's a tanky bit of dialogue and you please get no no you're on to the next thing straight away. Great. So I think it was you know it had a lot of the flaws of the Chibnall era, but it was kind of the, the Chibnall era at its best. If you know what I mean, Ian, you're you're a, a big fan of the Jodie Whittaker era. What, what was your <laughs> view? Do you, 
How do you feel? The number of now? times, the number of times you've watched Legend of the Sea Devils is incredible. Yeah, yeah, yeah on on repeat. Um, so I'm trying, I'm trying to do that that thing of imagining I'm a wide-eyed child watching this rather than a, a you know a decrepit old man. And I think if I was an eight-year-old kid, I'd still be sitting here going, "What? What? Why not do anything with that idea? Why was that not fleshed out? What? Why did we bother with this? Why?" It feels like it feels like an era that was kind of impacted by COVID and had to change directions, and maybe we didn't get what originally was in Chibnall's mind, but. Yeah. I, you know, and uh, for the third time of saying it, I don't want to be the negative one, but it's well, not an era I'm going to be coming back to. Well, you're you're kind of um, not repeating, but um, um, you're kind of saying exactly what I was about to say. That I think when Chibnall Zero starts, it looks like he's going to be full throated sort of mm. story arcs and character development, and I think it is. It's a COVID. The, the effects of COVID on Flux, uh, the slight chaos of these final specials uh, with the sort of the scrabbling around, changing the scheduling, adding another one in. Um, it's sort of all kind of just, it feels a bit empty to me. It feels yeah. like it sort of falls apart at the end. But I think with this, with Power of the Doctor instinctively, I feel like I don't mind that so much because it, I found it such good, such good fun. That there are there are a few Chibnall stories that I would re rewatch happily rewatch. And there are quite there are a few. There are sort of five or six. And I think Power of the Doctor is the the special that I would probably rewatch. Absolutely. Let um, me let me ask you a question. I want to sort of expand on something John said. If if you if you if you look at the the previous writers, you have RTD who was very. He did the emotional stuff. If you like, he was the heart. And you had Stephen Moffat, who did all the clever stuff. So he was the brain. Which organ do we think Chris Chibnall was? <laughs> Knew you'd go there. Oh. I don't think he's an organ. I think he's, <laughs> he's deliberately come on. I think he's the skeleton. <laughs> okay. So I, I think he's got that kind of... I, I genuinely think he's got that kind of Terence Dix ability to to tightly structure a, a story from A to B to C. Mm. But he doesn't have he doesn't have the distinctiveness. I don't think he's and we try not to I mean you know it's difficult to write Doctor Who. It's almost impossible to write for television these days. You have to be a borderline genius to write get anything on television. Mm, yeah. But I think I think Moffitt and RTD are genuine kind of television auteurs that mm. you can watch something and you know exactly, oh, that's an RTD script or that's a Stephen Moffat line. And sometimes that's a negative thing because you think, oh, Stephen Moffat's writing his dialogue again. Yeah. But but it's so witty and it's so kind of it's so kind of smart and complex that actually that gets it past. I think Chibnall Chibnall is good at is good at plotting and is good at kind of making everything connect, but I don't think that's enough to be a a great TV writer. He's not going to be Dennis Potter. He's not going to live <laughs> live live through history as Dennis Potter. But some of his stuff will be kind of remembered for yeah. for being kind of you know popular. Let's let I'll go with the lungs then. How's that? The lungs. <laughs> the lungs. What? It, he kept, he's kept the show breathing for five years, and now it's going on. That's a lovely answer. And now I can see this, the 70th anniversary special is going to be Chip and Alati, D and Moffat in a remake of The Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz. <laughs> <laughs> the three <laughs> showrunners. <laughs> okay, so okay, so let's draw it to an end. Um, But let's score it, because I think that's what we do on this podcast. So let's score hmm. it out of ten. Out of 10. Um, but Ian, Ian, if you could score Legend of the Sea Devils first out of ten, <laughs> sure. We've just we've just got that score on record. Right, I'd give Legend of the Sea Devils two out of ten. Oh my god, that's probably that's the lowest generous. score for anything. That I I think I think that score is akin to when we scored the film version of Day of the Triffids from the nineteen fifties. Oh yes, you weren't you weren't enamoured of that, were you? I d I didn't even review it. I was away from the, re wow. the review. Wow. Um, yeah. So, so uh, how about how about Power of the Doctor? 
Um, I, in terms of the spectacle and the emotional effect parts of it had, I suppose it, it scores quite highly. But in terms of the internal logic and consistency of the master having a plot where he kills himself to take over the doctor's body, um, I yeah, I don't know, four, five, five. <sighs> Yeah, you know, we're going to have to get you on board with the the, sc- <laughs> the, score, the scoring metrics. The sure, 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 sure. Uh, John, um, how would you score Power of the Doctor? I, and why would you give it that score? Well, frankly, I'm, uh, you know, I, I agree with you in that, that the internal logic, it, it doesn't <laughs> particularly stand up. You know, not quite as well as something like Dave the Doctor did. But I just didn't care because I was having so much fun and because, let's face it, I forgive Christian of everything because he got William Russell back. And that's, I I say, I've been waiting for that for ages. So I'll go with, I'll go with an eight for that. Okay, so, so now I'm thinking of how I've scored other Chris Chibnall. So I have given episodes nines and tens. I think I gave Village of the Angels a ten because I was, I was really swept away by Village of the Angels. I gave Witch Hunters, I think, nine because I really, yeah. I was just so relieved because it was sort of witty <laughs> and, and it was sort of foresty and it had witches in it. Mm. Um, I think this is probably, yeah, I think this is probably an eight for me. I loved, yeah, I did like seeing William Russell back for the first time since 1965 to say one word. But I, it was Sophie Aldred that I was amazed by. I can now, I can now see how Sophie Aldred could carry a Sarah Jane Adventures series of her own. And I couldn't before, but now I'm kind of I'm kind of a big fan of that idea. Just bring Sophie Aldred back a few times. Um and just the joy of discovering that, of of kind of not redeeming her era, but kind of giving her more Doctor Who to play. I think that's, you know, that was worth it. Uh, so yeah, it's an eight for me. Hmm. Um so uh, next time, I, I'm assuming this review is going to go out and then a second review where I say exactly the same thing all over again, but with JR interrupting me <laughs> all the time <laughs> to, to explain why I'm wrong. I um, thought it'd be just JR with you getting in back the same number of words as William Russell did. My, 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 as, prediction, as works. <laughs> my prediction is JR will open with a five to ten minute monologue with one idea and then Simon and I will be scrabbling to actually... Like, interlock our views with that one idea and um, that's what normally happens but until then <clears throat> i was matt i was ian and i was john and we will speak again soon <laughs>